The British Museum building is almost as spectacular as the fabulous exhibits found within. As the world's most visited museum, it has been welcoming guests since it was founded in 1753. It was the first national public museum anywhere in the world. From the beginning, it granted free admission to all studious and curious persons. The original universal ambition to embrace all knowledge in the arts and sciences is depicted on the pediment above the main entrance. The Queen Elizabeth II Great Court was designed by Sir Norman Foster as the museum's Millennium Project. The facades of Smirk's original 19th century stone buildings were restored at this time. The whole of this two-acre space was formerly occupied by the British Library. All that remains is the stunning round reading room in which Karl Marx wrote Das Kapital. In all, it contains three miles of bookcases and 25 miles of shelves holding over 30,000 books. An astonishing glass roof covers the whole court, making it the largest covered public space in Europe. Sculptures and small exhibits are dotted around the court to whet your appetite for what you're about to see. Such as this lion from the ancient Greek city of Knidos to the modern stereograph giving a 360 degree view of the court. The unique layout of the museum means you can choose where to start your visit, unlike other museums where thousands of people are funneled along one route. We started our tour in the oldest part of the museum, the restored former King's Library now the Enlightenment Gallery. The exhibition focuses on the Enlightenment in Britain during the 18th and 19th centuries, the great age of discovery and learning into which the museum was born. On display are more than 5,000 objects. The room is graced by classical sculptures, collected by grand tourists and busts of enlightenment luminaries and collectors. Many of the items were collected by the great names of their day, such as Captain James Cook, Charles Darwin and Howard Carter, or donated by the likes of King George III. Here we see one of his scientific instruments, the orrery, a mechanical model of the solar system used to demonstrate Copernicus's theory that the Earth and planets revolve around the Sun. The museum holds many temporary exhibitions throughout the year. During our visit, it was showing the intricacies of wedding costumes and jewelry. We moved on to the living and dying gallery, where we were met with the sight of a giant East Island statue known as Hawa Hakanania. It was first displayed on a ceremonial platform in around 1000 AD and was later moved to a ritual house. It was collected in 1868 and given as a gift to Queen Victoria 
who donated it to the museum. A few steps away sits one of my favorite objects, a life-sized carving of a human skull made from a single block of rock crystal. It was acquired by the museum in 1897, purporting to be an ancient Mexican object. However, scientific research conducted by the museum has established that the skull was most likely produced in Europe during the 19th century, with the crystal having originated in Brazil. A small door led us into the Mexico gallery. In the center of the gallery, striking Huashtec figures in the pose they've stood in since the 16th century look out. The Olmec culture is one of the first great art styles of the Americas. Its monumentality is glimpsed even in much smaller pieces. At the back of the gallery are lintels from Lax Chilan depicting bird jaguar a Maya ruler standing over a captured noble. The stars of this gallery are undoubtedly the collection of turquoise covered Aztec ritual sacrifice masks. One can't help wondering for how many people looking into these masks was their last view on earth. Standing out amongst the turquoise goods is this double-headed serpent. It was worn by priests and rulers around the neck symbolizing fertility. A further door leads into the Native American gallery. The rich history of the American Indians is remembered through headdress, skins and totems. Much of the items were brought to England by Captain James Cook. The most popular gallery by far is the Egypt and Middle Eastern section. Entering we are met with one of the most important archaeological finds ever, the Rosetta Stone. If it wasn't for this ancient proclamation written in hieroglyphs, Egyptian script and Greek, Egyptian hieroglyphs would still not be able to be read. The gallery is laid out from the earliest to the end of the pharaonic period with many statues, sarcophagi, tombs, funerary and grave goods covering many pharaohs including Ramesses the Great, Tutankhamun, Hatshepsut and Amenhotep. One standout piece is this bronze cat representing the goddess Bastet dating from the Roman Egypt period around the year 30 BC. Another major find was this piece of wall. It's known as the King List, a chronological list showing all the pharaohs of ancient Egypt. In the era before mummification and the first dynasties, bodies like this one dating from 3250 BC were dried out naturally in the desert. They were then laid in coffins like this one from 2000 BC. However, as mummification became the norm in Egypt, the tombs, sarcophagi and coffins became more and more ornate and elaborate.
This is the beautiful coffin of a Roman Egyptian called Artemidirus, who died around 110 AD. These gilded inner and outer coffins were for the priestess Henot Mayet and date from 1250 BC. Here we see Shapti. These figures were placed next to the mummies in their coffin to assist in the afterlife. Being Egyptian wasn't all about death and building pyramids. This is a 3,000 year old board game played a little like drafts. The cabinets are crammed with funerary and temple goods. Leaving the Egyptian gallery, we pass between the giant man-headed winged bulls from an 8th century BC Assyrian palace. These colossal gateway figures are from Khorsabad, now in Iraq. The museum has three pairs of these gate sentinels. I wonder how many people have noticed the bulls have five legs, allowing them to be viewed from the front or side. An Assyrian stone carved frieze depicts their victory at the siege of Lachish in 701 BC. There is also a frieze showing a lion hunt. A white marble statue of Aphrodite welcomes us to the Greek gallery. As you would expect, this gallery is laden with classical statues and busts. We followed the development of sophisticated ceramics and their painted decoration, and the emergence of naturalism in sculpting the human form such as this bust in bronze of the head of Socrates from about 200 BC. Here we see a marble drum column from Ephesus, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This is the reconstruction of the Nereid monument from Santhos in Nikea, southwest Turkey. The tomb of a local ruler, it is decorated with sculptures in the Greek style, including the wind-swept Nereids, daughters of the sea god Nereus. Ahead of us are the friezes, metopes and pediment sculptures of the Parthenon, known as the Elgin Marbles. They form one of the greatest surviving achievements of classical art, illustrating both myths and historical events. They are one of the museum's most controversial exhibits. Between 1801 and 1805, Lord Elgin began removing the marbles, with the permission of the Greeks, and transporting them to London. The Greeks now, understandably, want them back. We move on to Roman Britain. Following a period of close contact, the Romans invaded Britain in 43 BC. On display are finds from the hordes found at Thetford, Hoxney, and the forts of Hadrian's Wall. Much gold and jewellery has been dug up, including these spectacular torques, worn by the Romans and Celts around the neck. 
gladiator helmets and the stunning Portland vase made of cameo glass a technical masterpiece and the most famous survivor of a rare kind of object that is extremely difficult to make many signs and mosaics have also survived the Asia gallery hold some wonderful pieces mainly from China and Japan clockwork and time showcases the best of clocks watches and wind-up items one of the finest is the magnificent Carillon clock of Isaac Habrecht, made in 1589. Watchers from the 16th century onwards were sometimes housed in exquisite gilded and enameled cases. The top points winner for me is this wind-up and imaginative timepiece, made in Augsburg, Germany in 1585. The striking of the hours and quarters were performed by sailors standing in the two crow's nests of the main mast. The ship was mounted on a wheeled carriage so that it could move along a dinner table propelled by clockwork which simultaneously caused the cannon to fire. The ship pitched up and down as if at sea. A fanfare started up as the heralds of the electors of the Holy Roman Empire processed before the Emperor who moved his head and hands. What a fantastic way to announce dinner. The glass, porcelain and pottery section holds some real treasures such as this enameled glass mosque lamp from the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem made in the 1300s to this beautiful glassware made in France around 1430 this English Tudor stoneware pot is from Hampton Court Palace and these two porcelain figures are from Xi'an in China. The quality of the exhibits in the European and British galleries are jaw-dropping. From conquistadors helmets to ornamental vases, classical busts through to magnificent gold and silverware. Three objects stood out for me. The first is the French Royal Gold Cup. 22 karat gold, it was made in 1380. The scenes relate to the life and miracles of Saint Agnes. The second is again solid 22 karat gold, is English, dating from around 1797. It was made by Humphrey Repton. It's known as the Gold Portland Font. The final of my three choices is the Frank Casket from the 8th century. Made entirely of whalebone, it is decorated with Christian, pagan and runic inscriptions. The Gallery of Ancient Britain shows just how sophisticated our ancestors were. Elaborate jewellery and stoneware abound. The Lewis Chessmen were discovered on a beach on the Isle of Lewis in the Shetland Isles. They date from 1150 AD. The chess pieces consist of elaborately worked walrus ivory and whale's teeth crafted into seated kings and queens, mitred bishops, 
knights on their mounts and pawns in the shape of obelisks but pride of place goes to the remains from the Sutton Hoo ship burial in 1939 Basil Brown excavated a large mound at Sutton Hoo in Suffolk and discovered an undisturbed ship burial inside lay not only everyday items but an elaborate shield and this very rare helmet the museum commissioned an exact replica to be made to demonstrate what the helmet would have looked like in all its glory also found were hundreds of gold coins worth millions at today's rates I'll finish with this rather quirky temporary exhibit by Australian Ron Muek this massive sleeping self-portrait was made in 2002 it is so spookily realistic <laughs>